we, unaccustomed to courage, exiles from delight, live coiled in shells of loneliness, until love leaves its high holy temple and comes into our sight and liberate us into life. Love arrives. And in its train comes ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet if we are bold, love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity, timidity. In the flush of love's light, we dare be brave. And suddenly we see that love, that love costs all we are and will ever be. Yet it is only love that sets us free. What's up everybody? Thank you for being here. Welcome to Love and Good Music. I'm your host Erica Cookie Alexander and this is episode two. Thank you guys so much for the love on episode one. If you haven't seen it, make sure you go click the link and go watch it. Uh, it was a great kickoff. It was my birthday. So thank you guys for the best birthday a girl had in a long time. And then you can go watch my Soul Train line too. My birthday party was cracking. I um, mean, in the middle of a pandemic, I don't know how I got so much love, but I did. And I'm so excited for everybody who has just been pouring out and pouring into me. And I hope to pour back into you guys today, okay? Uh, so today, uh, uh, like I said, welcome to Love and Good Music, where we explore love through the, mu through the lens of music, poetry, um, spirituality, and literature, and all kinds of other things. Um, but uh, that was a poem right there by uh, Mama Maya Angelou. I call her Mama Maya Angelou because uh, definitely a, um, a female figure in my life that I definitely look up to. Um, you'd be surprised that I didn't learn about Maya Angelou until I was in high school. But yes, it wasn't until high school that I was introduced to black literature. And you're looking at me like, because <laughs> you see some black skin, but I'm definitely a mixed, uh, a product of a biracial family. My mother is Mexican and my father is black. And so, you know, together they had this beautiful thing, but, you know, I was raised heavily on my Latino side. So black literature was not something that was readily available for me. No shade to my family. It just wasn't available to me. So when I went to high school, I had a black high school counselor, shout out to Miss Rogers, who kind of took me under her wing and was like, you need to learn about your history and your past. And she, you know, put me in all these different classes that I probably never would have been exposed to. She would take me to all these different summits and uh, speaking events and things like that. And that's where I got to see uh, Maya Angelou perform. It was the first time I seen her perform a uh, phenomenal woman. That's when I fell in love with that poem. And um, I was like, who is this lady? I, I feel green now because if I knew who she was then, I would have been like, give me a picture or something, but I didn't know who she was. I'm not going to lie. I didn't know who she was. And then that was definitely what led me down the rabbit hole of her work and her poems. Of course, I started with, I know what, who the caged bird sings and went down that whole, uh, you know, rabbit hole, gained mad respect for uh, all her work. She led me to Toni Morrison and other, you know, um, black women authors that are just like the bomb so super grateful to that i hope it blessed you guys um it's this it's called um touched by an angel and the reason why i chose that is because it speaks about love but it also speaks to what we're going to be talking about in our um uh, spread love uh segment today which is about dealing with loss now you might say well how is dealing with loss spreading love well, I just want to talk about how I deal with, dealt with the loss that was very heavy hit for me and um, seeing how I've transformed that energy and seeing if I can bless somebody else through that 
um, who may be also going through that same pain. So um, our spread love segment today is about dealing with loss. Then we're going to go into our uh, good music segment, which is where we uh, dissect a song and we uh, see where it's talking about music and where the lyrics from and what narrative, you know, that has been built for us and um, things like that. Just dissecting it. Uh, then I got some books that I've been reading for the month of February. Like I said, I'm challenging myself to three books a month, uh, which will be 36 months, uh, 36 months, 36 books at the end of the year for me. So that's a big challenge. I haven't read like that since college. I don't even think I read 36 books a year in college, but maybe it was the amount of pages I read. It was probably about that. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to challenge myself to get smarter, to dive deeper into the things that I have questions about. You only know if you continue to grow and find the things that resonate for you. And so that's what it is for me. And I hope that I continue to bless you. I got my cookie jar here. Didn't even turn my damn, uh, <laughs> I didn't even turn my hourglass on because now I'm timing myself. Um, and my love stories and I got some love stories in here. Uh, so we'll see which one we pick today and just to start us off, you know, I like to start us off with some good uh, vibes. Uh, I'm the good vibe lady and um, So today last episode we cleared with Palo Santo to get the show going and today I cleared with sage This is white sage uh, and it's wrapped in a red uh, Yarn and usually it's just you know for protection um and red is usually that color that represents that so or it could also mean abundance too you know sometimes people tie a red string if they want to bring money so it can mean different things everybody has different meanings for things but uh, I know this is for like protection and to weed out negativity and so this is a full bundle and this is one that I would use like through my household like if I wanted to clear the vibes of my household but today I just pulled off a little branch and just cleared my space it, it was just to smooth my vibes it was supposed to get all the negativity out you know sometimes I get on here and I'm really nervous and I just need to release that out into you know and plus I get in my head sometimes about what I'm saying and I just need to clear all that and to let whatever is supposed to come out and be here for you guys and let it heal and just let it flow and so just so that I can continue to let things flow I want to see what our message is today as far as what source wants us to understand uh, before we get this episode started so we're gonna dig into our daily affirmation positive affirmation cards this is a um a deck from uh she glows within i uh, found her on instagram don't know the girl but love her deck uh so let's see what we're about to pick today It's this one okay this one says breathe and glow oh. the back says forgiveness Ooh, child. I definitely always need this so let's read the back breathe and glow inhale for four three two one then hold then release then you say this affirmation then there's more so let's do this together okay so we're gonna inhale for four then we're gonna hold then we're gonna release then we're gonna say the affirmation and I'm gonna go all the way down okay so the first one is forgiveness is for my own self-care okay then the next one is forgiveness leads me back to my heart forgiveness opens me up to my higher self Forgiveness allows me to radiate beyond my darkest wounds and forgiveness is my own self-care. Okay, so let's go through. Forgiveness is for my own self-care. Forgiveness leads me back to my heart. Okay. 
Forgiveness opens me up to my higher self. Forgiveness allows me to radiate past my darkest wounds. Forgiveness is for my own self-care. I love that. Ashe, thank you for that. Ooh, we're going to be doing a lot of breathing today. And breathing is so important. It's something that I'm learning that is definitely a useful tool when you're stressed, when you're overwhelmed, when you're anxious, when you're sad, when you're depressed. Breathe, 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 breathe. Can't tell you enough. Um, so like I said before, uh, this episode is a little bit different. Totally didn't ever see myself going here with this, but this has been calling me. I feel like I need to get it off my chest. I need to release and I need to let it go. Um, and so I wanted to talk about dealing with loss. And I don't know what that looks like for certain people. And loss can come in so many different ways. You could lose a friend and not just death. This is just a friend that can move away. You could lose a relationship. You could lose a job. You could lose all kinds of things. But all of these things hold energy. And when you lose these things, that energy cord breaks and you have to deal with the um, absence of that energy and dealing with the absence of that energy is different for every person and everybody, like I said, everybody grieves differently. That's so true. And so I just want to take you through uh, seven stages of grief for me, what it looked like and where I'm at in my final stage now and where I want to live the rest of my life. Uh, so I hope this blesses you. And, and if it uh, resonates for you, please share it. Um, I didn't even say that. Like, subscribe, like, subscribe, um, share this with a friend. Um, and just let's keep spreading love, guys. So <clears throat> let me take a deep breath because this is going to be very vulnerable for me to do this. Um, So this was about dealing with the loss of my uh, grandmother. She um, died four days after Christmas in 2018. So it was definitely a shock to the family. And so that's number one for me. I'll take you through the steps. So the stages of loss for me and grieving for me were what I call number one was shock. Number two, tunnel vision. And I'll break that down. Number three, I call it pocket mode resistance. Number four, I call it the black hole. Number five, I call it inspector gadget. Number six, I call it the healing phase. And number seven, which is the phase that I'm in now, is my gratitude phase. And so we'll go into all of those and we'll break those down. So uh, like I said a few minutes ago, my grandmother died very suddenly uh, four days after Christmas. So that was the last time I had seen her um, was four days before she passed away. So getting that phone call that someone that you had just saw is no longer with you was shocking as hell. Um, it was shocking. It hurt beyond belief. I still remember that pain like you know like your heart like tightens up and it's just like <sighs> I felt like I couldn't breathe I remember my mom was on the phone me hung up on her I was like I don't want to talk to nobody um, I just I couldn't believe it and just to understand and process that because this was my first time ever really dealing with that somebody that close to me it's different when you hear oh da 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 pass away or oh da 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 pass away oh da 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 pass away but when it hits home, it's like, oh, fuck. Wait, what? Um, so I went into, like, emergency stress mode. You know, my mind was just going crazy. 
like what happened you know you you make up thoughts of what you think happened at their death even though nobody happened knows what happened at their death because nobody was there nobody was there when she died uh they were in the other room but nobody was there so nobody saw it nobody knows what happened so you know my brain's over here making shit up like oh she died like this oh she died like this or oh and then i'm like oh you know was it painful like did she hurt did she suffer was it fast was it quick you know your brain's just going crazy i'm bringing up childhood memories i'm bringing up like times we fought and like I'm getting angry at myself and I'm thinking of times we had a good time and I'm over here laughing and all of this is through tears and smile and like <laughs> and um, that was hard you know just numb 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 I feel her here with me. Thank you for that. Okay. So my second stage is called tunnel vision. Now, this is when I became very selfish because I could only see me. I only cared about how I felt. I only cared about my feelings, my emotions, what I was going through. I lost her. Nobody else lost her. I lost her. It was the I, I, I phase. You know, oh my God, what is this going to do for my life? Oh my God, I can't move on. Um, and, you know, I'm making fun of myself now, but it's a very real stage and I don't want to feel like I'm mocking anybody going through this stage because it's very real. And it's okay to go through this phase. Everybody grieves differently. So I went through this whole phase where... I didn't care how anybody else felt about her death. I didn't care how anybody else was grieving about her death. It was just me and how I was feeling. And I was just so lost, you know. And it was just about, you know, am I going to be okay? Not anybody else in my family. Didn't care how my grandfather felt having his wife die. Didn't care how my aunt, uncle, my mother felt having their mother die. You know, how my brothers felt having their grandmother die or how my cousins felt having their grandmother die. It was all about me. It was all about how Erica felt. So that was interesting. Um, I call that my tunnel vision phase. Um, you're just like in a black box, you know. I was just a black box. And it was just me by myself. And I just needed to feel. And so I just locked myself up and it was just me. Um, number three, I call pocket mode. Now, this is also resistance. Uh, there was days where I pretended she was in my back pocket. I've always lived away from home for the last 10 years. I've lived out of the city. So this was very easy for me to pretend that she was away because it wasn't often that I saw her. So I kind of disconnected this way by saying, oh, it's okay. She's just over there. There, She's just over there. She's, she's, just, she's, she's in my back pocket. Um, resisting to not wanting to believe that her death was real. So I just put it off. I put it away. Like, go over there. Go over there. I can't deal with this right now. So there was definitely a part where I just blocked it out because that's how I was able to cope. That was able, how I was able to go to work. That was able, able to take a shower and go outside and be amongst people and not be crying like a freaking crybaby all the time. I had to block it out. I made a mental block. So just complete, just back pocket. She's over there. She's not gone. She's over there. You know, she's in my back pocket. Number four was the worst. This was the depths of the depths of the depths of my depression. After I realized she wasn't in my back pocket and you finally like face the reality of it and there comes a time some people face it right away and some people have to get there and process it like I did. I was just in such a freaking depressed state. I didn't even know 
what to do. And it's back to that not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to get out of the shower. I mean, not wanting to get up to shower, not wanting to do any of these things because it finally hit me like she's gone. You know, she's not coming back. As much as I wanted to pretend as she was, she's not coming back. And it made it real. And that's when I went into like depression. And I'm crying because I remember what that feels like. You know, it's just like trap. Help me out. Help me out. Help me out. Help me out. Can't get out. Can't get out of these feelings. Can't get out of these thoughts. Can't get out of the I shoulda, I woulda, I coulda. Can't get out. Just can't get out. Can't get out. So then that led me to number five, which is Inspector Gadget Mode, which is where I literally just went on a binge where I was looking up everything death related. I wanted to know what happened at the time of death. What happened after death? What happened? What happens? What happened? Where's my grandma at? Somebody help me, please. Somebody help me. Um, so I just started binging all this information. I was watching documentaries. I was buying books. I went crazy. Uh, but it was beautiful because it's what ultimately led me back to my relationship with God, source, energy. It grew my relationship stronger in trying to reach my spirit guides and my ancestors and ultimately me ultimately led me to feeling her and receiving her love outside of human body form. And so that was really healing for me. But I was in inspector gadget mode. I was like, go, go gadget. I got, uh, what do they call those? Uh, those, uh, the little mirror, the little mirrors make things big. Damn it, hourglass. No, is it hourglass? It's hourglass. Those damn things. I don't know. Those little like. Oh, anyways, leave it in the comments for me. I don't know what that damn thing is. The little like, it's like glasses, but it makes like. Anyways, I was looking for all the clues, okay? I was looking for all the clues. Oh my god. I was looking for all the clues. Um, it was actually a really good documentary on Netflix. You know, I don't get no residuals for this, so I'm going to plug them anyways. Um, surviving Death was really good. really goes into like a lot of different elements of death, uh, near-death experiences, mediums, um, you know, people having, um, coming back and, you know, being in their bodies and rem remembering their past lives. It goes into all of that. I highly recommend it if you're interested in your searching. A good place to start and then I'm sure it'll take you down its own rabbit hole. Um, so that was it. So that was part of my number six was the healing road, the coming back to God, coming back to source, coming back to me and getting back into my body because I was having an outer body experience and depression, but coming back into me and centering myself and making sure that I was okay and making sure that my relationship with my higher power was strong and that my faith was back, restored, because it was gone. Um, and so that is number six, which I call my healing phase, where I just had to find my way back to self. To my self-love and when you find self you find higher connection to source power and so that was what was a, a big part of my journey and then number seven to wrap this whole thing up is a phase of gratitude I had to change my mindset about her being gone and instead of saying things like oh I'm so sad she's not gonna see my little boy you know, grow up, I had to say things like, I'm so glad that she met my son. I'm so glad that she held him. I'm so glad that she loved him, that she got to smell him, that she got to kiss him, that she got to love on him. And then that started bringing so much joy to my heart 
is instead of thinking of all the things that I didn't have from her not being here, I really turned it around into all of the things that I had. Like, wow, I had my grandmother for 33 years of my life. There are some people who haven't had their grandmother at all, never had an opportunity to meet her, or they lost her when they were five, or they were, you know, all these other things. So when I shifted my attitude into one of gratitude is when the real healing came. And I miss her like fucking crazy, of course. You know, I miss her like crazy. But I'm so glad that I got to share space with her in this lifetime. And I have those memories of her that will last me through my lifetime. And that is something that I would rather have had and not had than, you know, never had experienced her. So I'm forever grateful. So thank you guys again, just to wrap that up again, my phases were shock, tunnel vision, pocket mode, black hole, inspector gadget, healing, and then gratitude. I feel like if you find some sort of way to get to the road of gratitude, you will be on your road to healing too. So. I hope that was um, helpful for you guys, and I can't believe I cried on here. Oh my god. I said I wasn't going to cry, but yeah, it happens, and um, that's me and living in my 2021 um, lane of being vulnerable. I would have never, ever cried on camera, so I'm just digging in, digging in there, okay? Um, all right, how are we doing on time? I'm taking a long time. All right, let's move this along. So, Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You is the song that we have today for our good music segment. Um, so, jumping into the first lyrics. So, this is what we do on this segment, guys. We jump into some certain lyrics and then just discuss how it resonates for love with us. And we're trying to ultimately build our definition of love. And now we're going to go in through the lens of music. So, Everybody knows Whitney Houston belted this out on stages across the world and we were singing along with her. I know I was. And so what were we singing? Were we singing a song of love or were we singing a song of desperation, of sacrifice? Um, let's jump on in, okay? So first lyric, here we go. It's the first lines of the song. If I should stay, I would only be in your way. So I'll let go, but I know I'll think of you every step of the way. So I've sang this song a million times, but I never really dove into the lyrics like this. And um, this sounds very sacrificial to me. Like, you're going to let your love go? Like, what? But then you're going to think of them the whole love of the way? Um, but no, after, you know, really like taking a dive, like that seems very admirable and unselfish um, in somebody's character to say, I can't love you the way that you need to be loved. Or maybe, you know, there's something that is going to stop this union. And so I'm going to let you go and do your own thing so that you can get the love that you need. That's like the highest love ever, right? To say, I love you and I'm going to let you go because you deserve more. Okay, Dolly Parton, I think you wrote it. If you didn't write it, you were the original singer, but I don't know who wrote it. Damn, I never know who writes these. That's going to be on my next one. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, you know, that ultimate sacrifice, very some selflessness I hear in those lyrics. Like, if I, I'm only going to be in your way if I stay, so I'm going to let you go. Selfish people would never. <laughs> Second lyrics. Um, and I will always love you. I will always love you, which is the chorus. Okay, so love is definitely a soul tie. So those lyrics are definitely, you know, simple lyrics, but there's definitely something different there, which when you love somebody, you're tied to the soul. And that's on every level. You connect this soul tie to friends, family, colleagues, People that you hold in high gratitude and high, you know, uh, uh, like affinity. And these people end up tying to your soul. 
And, you know, so when you tell somebody, I'm always, I will always love you, that's real. And that's whether your words say it or not. Your soul is tied to this person. So you ever wonder why you're thinking about an ex that you dated like six years ago and like this fool pops into your mind? It's because your soul is so tied to him, whether you thought so or not. And you can become untied to people, but you have to do that work to untie your soul from that person. That's why it's called a soul tie. Um, so... Uh, that's why, you know, when they say, oh, like, I just can't get this guy out of my system. No, you can't. You can't. He's in your soul. Um, and yes, you can. Sorry, let me rephrase. Yes, you can, but you got to do work to get him out. But that's like a really real thing. Like you're tied, tied by soul. So yes, you will always love somebody. And that's why sometimes it's always is a little tug inside your heart. If you see your ex or, you know, you see somebody that has left your life it's because those ties are very strong. And if it didn't end negatively, you're most likely always gonna have, you know, feelings of affection towards that person. The soul is, it's, you know, it's, it's releasing its vibration off to that person. That vibration is what it remembers. And if it remembers love, then you're always gonna have that special, you know, when they say, oh, I have this special place in my heart. No, that's that tie, that tie is still there still there so be uh very careful who you tie to i'm tied to some crazy mofos i need to get them out Woo! <laughs> okay last lyrics last lyrics i hope life treats you kind and i hope you have all you dreamed of no and I'm wishing you joy and happiness. But above all this, I wish you love. Yeah, you guys are supposed to do that because I'm not going to sing that. So I, um, but wouldn't the world be just a better place if we all wish our exes love? Like, right? Just look at this. Selfishness. I hope you have all you've dreamed of. I'm wishing you love and joy and happiness. Wow, it takes a really strong person to wish somebody that they love that's going away all of those things. But I think this is the like true definition of love. Saying like, if your love is over there, I love you enough for you to go get that love over there. And I'm going to love you watching you get that love over there. That's true. That's true love if I ever freaking seen it. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. And I feel like that's kind of what life is like, right? It's when you have those special, life is a blur, right? It's like, if you had to look back at your life, you remember certain parts, right? Those special moments, those key moments that you can have and put in your vault of memories, like, oh, my 10th birthday, oh, my wedding, oh, my, my birth of my child. Life is about experiences, right? So if you have those vaults of experience, love is one of those things that you put in the vault. And when you have that vault with somebody, it can't go away. So the idea of, you know, holding that space for someone and allowing them to let go and to go hold that space with somebody else. That is amazing. And to wish them well on that journey. Whew. That's some good karma. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about that. But um, that's going to do it for that edition of some good music. I would say that Whitney Houston's Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You is definitely good music. It's teaching us to be selfless and to love from a space of true love, meaning I'm not confining you to anything here that you don't need. Go get it over there if that's going to be best for you. And I wish you joy and happiness. So I aspire to have that type of love. <laughs> All right. Do we have time for the cookie jar? Y'all want to do a cookie jar? I'm running out of time. All right, we're going to do the cookie jar really quickly, guys, because we got to get out of here. I'm going to pack my time. <laughs> it's okay. It's my shot. I can do whatever I want, right? I just like to keep this quick. All right, let's see what we got, y'all. This one is called The Alley of the Kiss. The Alley of the Kiss. Oh, I'm so excited. 
This one comes from, hold on, let me get my notes. The Mexican city of Guanajuato, Guanajuato, Mexico, okay? And oh my God, this is crazy because this is kind of like a Romeo and Juliet type of thing too. Like, is this like our theme or what? Okay, so here we go. This is the story called The Alley of the Kiss or in Espanol, it's called El Callejón del Beso. So, here we go. El Callejón del Beso by Queen Cookie. All right, so this story takes place in um, Guanajuato, Mexico, about 300 years ago when Spain was still the owner of, not the owner, when Spain was still, like, you know, the territorial ruler of Mexico. Well, back then, uh, if you were of pure Spaniard blood, you were considered the um, the pure race. And then if you were of mixed blood or mestizo blood, you were considered, you know, the secondary, you know, in superior race. So this is about a Spaniard, rich Spaniard merchant and his daughter, Carmen. We're going to call her Carmen because that's what my mom is. Car Carmen. So Carmen. And she is the daughter of a rich merchant. And um, the only time she ever gets to leave her house is to go to mass, to go to church. And so Carmen's on the way to mass one day and she meets Luis. Luis Miguel. No, she meets Luis, who is this poor mestizo miner. Of course, you always want what you can't have, right? So of course she can't bring him home to her rich dad. He's pure blood. She's gonna bring this, you know, um, broke mestizo home. He's gonna kick her ass. That's not how this rolls. So, Carmen and Luis, you know, they're sneaking behind. Every time she goes to church, she's seen him, blah, blah, blah. Well, daddy got the word. Daddy's always get the word. Daddy got word that Carmen and Luis are sitting in a tree. And he was like, uh uh, honey, not on my watch. So, he locks her up in her room. And he's get her ready to marry this rich Spaniard of pure Spaniard blood. And so Luis gets word of her not being able to come out again. So he's sitting at the bottom of her window and he's looking up at the balcony. And she's sitting over the balcony and she's crying, she's crying. And um, what happens is he looks across and the way that the, um, the alley that she lived in there was a balcony across from her that faced her. And so he knew that it was close enough to where they could actually like touch each other because the way of the buildings were, were, were the architecture of the buildings. So he goes and asked the people if he could get on their balcony and they like agreed. So they're like sharing a kiss over the balcony and her dad walks in and he's pissed. He's so mad to see her kissing like this poor ass minor dude that he stabs her in the heart and she's like bleeding to death and so Luis like jumps over the balcony and he's holding her to her death and he kisses her and till she dies. That's why it's called, you know, the alley of the kisses and the story goes on to say that he jumps off of the balcony to his death. And so the, um, the going story is that people can still visit this alley to this day. It's in Playa de los Angeles, woo -woo, LA, but not in LA, but LA. Um, and um, the, it is said, hold on, that if you go to the, uh, what is it called? El Callejón del Beso, and you kiss your lover there, that your love will be for eternity. Uh, I don't know about all these deaths, but it always ends good. So thank you for blessing us with a love story. That is the story of Carmen and Luis, Luis Miguel. Um, I've heard it, different names, but those are our names for today, okay? Um, and I'm an avid traveler. I can't wait to go to, to Plaza de los Angeles with my lover and do a little kiss at the El Callejón del Beso. El Callejón del Beso. So take your lover there and give her a kiss. Tell her Cookie told you. All right, last segment before I get out of here. So book club time, book club time, book, 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 book club time. All right, 
So, and you know, I got a lot of books over here and these are just a little bit. I got more books everywhere. So when I was watching the last episode, for some reason, this book popped out at me. And this is The Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan. I know, so random. But out of all these books, this one was like, come here, girl, come here, girl. So um, the most I ever read of this book was the movie and i don't the, the most i've ever known about this book was the movie that it made so it was interesting uh to read this this was definitely uh an interesting uh light into the chinese history and their culture i love it because i just told the story last uh last episode about the butterfly lover so it was only meant for me to dive more into chinese culture but definitely talks about chinese immigration um and how coming to america getting involved in America, keeping your traditions alive when your ch your children are like assimilating to American culture and how they're losing their, you know, their traditions and how the younger generation deals with it versus the older generation. So it's just a, it's a good read, uh, just a good fun read. And I kind of needed that in my life because a lot of things I read right now are very heavy. So The Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan. Lord have mercy. This one is on my table again. The Orishas, Goddesses, and Voodoo Queens. What would you think if I told you this book came back into my life? It came back into my life. So I'm uh, in a book club too with some uh, like-minded women. And this book came up. And so we're reading it again. And I, yes, I'm reading it again because I feel like when you read things a second time, you see things differently. And um, we had a challenge to open the book and see where you landed. I landed on Yemaya, which is the mother of ocean love. You know, she's supposed to be the mother of the waves, the, the giver of love. And it's so crazy because we're about to focus on Yemaya and my sisterhood circle. I'm like, oh my gosh, I picked her. So I was really excited to be circling back again. So this is another read that I'm, I'm reading this again, y'all. So I wanted to just bring this in. And then last but not least, I have Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh and um, this definitely came to me. I was cleaning out a drawer of mine, like I said this is not the only place where I keep my books. I was cleaning out a drawer of mine and this book was in that drawer and I was like oh my gosh I forgot about that book. I forgot I had it and I opened it up and I was like oh man this was for me right now um, because it just talks about you know being mindful being present, being aware. Um, and so it's called Living Buddha, Living Christ because he talks about Zen Buddhism and Christianity and how they're very similar and how the message at the end of it is mindfulness and breathing and uh, peacefulness and, um, you know, all of those things. And so it's a great read, very fast, 10 chapters. You could probably read it in like three, four days. I finished it very quickly, but it's a good read. And if you're one of those people who are Christian and you're on the edge of like spirituality and the shift and like maybe in that phrase, this is a good um, opener because he talks a lot about the, the Jesus, uh, about Jesus, you know, the Christ who walked earth and a lot about, you know, the Buddha and the, you know, how the Vietnamese uh, perceive Buddha. So very good read. Um, Whoa, I felt like I was speeding through that last part, but whew, thank you guys so much for being here once again for love and good music. I will be bringing you another episode soon. Uh, I'll be reading some more books, some more love stories. I'll have another uh, love edition for you guys too. Um, before I leave, I'm going to leave you with this chocolate chip or my health tip, my, I'm sorry, my, my, you know, my tip, my smell the roses tip from last time. And that is your gut does not lie. Please, please, please follow your intuition. Do whatever you can to follow that little voice inside your head. When your gut tells you no, it's a no. And when your gut tells you yes, it's a yes. And please follow that. I'm learning to follow my gut and follow my intuition. And it hasn't steered me astray yet. That's my chocolate chip of the night you see what i did there chocolate chip chocolate chip so yeah they're not gonna be like my little tips anymore they're gonna be called chocolate chips all right so that's it for me today guys thank you so much for watching um i just want to leave you with some love and light and now i want to dig into a little bit because people always say oh love and light love and light and it's like well what does that really mean what does that really 
mean? So, you know, love is the highest vibration. I talked about that on show one. It's the highest vibration, universal love, love yourself, love others. Um, and in offering frequencies of love, gratitude, creation, and wisdom, those all come when you say, I wish you love. Um, and so when you say, I offer light, it's energy a frequency of wisdom and of guidance. So I'm sending you light. I'm sending you wisdom. I'm sending you a frequency of, of guidance. I'm sending you light. I'm sending you energy so that you can uh, receive message from source. You need a little bit more, you know, so to say. So I send you love. I send you light. I hope that is great for the beginners. I'm here for you because I was those that person one time like, you know, hearing all these new terms and terminology. I'm like, what is this? So I'm here for you guys. I got you. We're on this spiritual journey together. So thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys again. Thank you for tuning in, subscribing, like, click the bell, all of those things. Pass it to your friends. And as always, spread love and good nature. Namaste.